Good morning. Doing business the right way is our panel today. And probably the most important issue that business faces today is the issue of trust. Over the last five years, we've seen a real change in trust, the lack of trust in terms of business. So this morning, we've assembled a group of international business leaders to talk about how business can regain that trust, how leadership around the world can get the trust and confidence back of the people. Let me introduce Richard Gorder, Chief Executive Officer, Managing Director of West Farmers Australia, Co-Chair of the Consumer Community Government Meeting. Aaron Kramer is President and Chief Executive Officer, Business for Social Responsibility, BSR, and on the Global Agenda Council on the Role of Civil Society. Feike Shibeshma is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board, Royal DSM of the Netherlands. Indra Nui is the CEO of PepsiCo and the Chairman of PepsiCo USA, World Economic Foundation Board Member as well. And Dennis Nally is with us, the Chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers International. Thank you all of you for joining us today and tackling this important subject. Dennis, let me kick this off with you. Uh, Pricewaterhouse came out with a study, a survey last night, talking to 1,500 CEOs around well, 13, the world? 1,300 CEOs. 1,300 CEOs, yeah. CEOs around the world. What were the key findings in terms of trust? So, so interesting observations coming out of the survey. Um, CEOs were, were asked to talk about uh, you know, how they feel about the trust uh, uh, equation that exists today. CEOs are actually saying that uh, trust is at an all-time low. Uh, and I think we would say trust within most institutions is, is, is low today. You know, whether you think about uh, governments, you think about other institutions, uh, one of the real big issues that are, that are out there. Uh, interestingly, though, when you ask specifically, uh, you know, the, the, the relationships that exist between business and governments today, it, it is absolutely at the lowest point, uh, which really is of concern. Uh, and when you think about some of the challenges that exist, the way things are really moving forward uh, in this dynamic world, Without that degree of trust, uh, it's going to really have a significant implication to the recovery of this global economy. So I think, I think business has got a real problem. Business has a challenge to really focus on, which is how do you begin to really regain that level of trust? Uh, and I think we have a very important role to play in that debate. <clears throat> Before we get to you know, how to really move the needle on, on trust, I'd like to talk a bit about the ramifications. Andrew, what are the ramifications? What, what is the impact? of a lack of trust, of this zero confidence in our institutions in the world. Yeah, but, but before I answer that, can I go back to Dennis? Dennis, when you asked the question about business, what do the uh, people you're surveying mean when they say business? Is it everybody? Is it a small group of companies? Is it an industry? What do they mean by business? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, Indra. But I, I would say, in the broadest sense, they're talking about business in general. Uh, it starts with, uh, you know, what were the causes of the financial crisis? Who's responsible for that? It goes to the issue of CEO compensation, the disparity of pay between workers and executives within an organization. So it's a very broad issue, but the lack of confidence in business today, the lack of trust in business today is of real concern. <clears throat> yeah, so Maria, to your question, I think today businesses are really the only functioning entities around the world. They create the jobs, they're the engines of efficiency, and if we don't have private enterprise and business, I'm not sure economies can be successful, especially at a time when governments are unable to enact policy uh, in, within countries or on a coordinated basis around the world. So if you don't put your trust in business, who are you going to put your trust in? I mean, NGOs, everybody trusts enormously, but NGOs don't create jobs. Okay, NGOs raise issues, which you know, are all warranted, but they raise issues. Private enterprise creates the jobs. So I think it's high time we sat down and asked ourselves, what is business? If it's a small group of uh, industries that created the financial crisis, let's isolate them because 90% of business is still doing things the right way. So I think it's important we really get down to a definition that's more specific. And I look at the Edelman Trust Survey, and it actually says, Trust in business is improving. I think it improved about 10 or 12 points over the last survey. So I'm going to look at this and say mm. there are green shoots of recovery, if you want to call it, on mm. this trust aspect. So I'm hopeful that people will realize that uh, you need business to get economies going. 
And as long as governments start accepting that business is needed to keep the engines of economy going, um, I think we should be in an okay shape. You make a lot of good points, particularly the fact that 90% of business is doing business the right way. Exactly. What is business the right way? The number of stakeholders has changed over the last several years, or the perception of the stakeholders has changed. But I want to get back to the implications here, because Aaron, around the world in the last several years, we've seen demonstrations. We've seen social unrest. We've seen the people get angry as a result of this lack of trust. What are, talk to us about those implications if we don't fix this or the perception of it. Well, and, it, and it's harder to fix it because we live in a hyper-transparent world, as, as everyone knows. And um, you know, the central challenge of the 21st century is to build prosperity for a planet with 9 billion people um, in a way that is consistent with the natural resources that we've got. And, and as Indra says, we can't do that without business being engaged. But people look around and they see all institutions NGOs, business, government, um, failing uh, to come up with big solutions on, on these questions. So the answer for business, I think, is to look um, to tie strategy to the big challenges we face, whether it's climate change, whether it's building prosperity in the rising markets that where life has improved so quickly and the promise to do more is, is even greater, and, and to, to try to be engaged in building uh, the kinds of institutions that can make that possible. Because we currently have um, public markets that, that overemphasize short-term uh, returns. And it's very hard to deal with these, these systemic questions if you've got that. And so I think business has a huge stake uh, in, in advocating for uh, a, a trading system that places more value on long-term decisions. Isn't but, but, but Aaron, just to stay with that point, if, 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 if business is here for the long-term, the sustainable you know, program that you're really trying to create for an organization, if those investors in that company only want to think about immediate, short-term financial returns, quarter to quarter, how does business really deliver that message about long-term sustainability? Well, I, I think the question is, and we talked about this a bit, er, a bit earlier, the question is, do you want to be around for three years, for three quarters, or for three decades? Yeah, right. And um, I, I think you know, it's tough when we've had holdings in the United States that, that used to be kept for seven years are now kept for seven months. Right. In that environment, it's very, very difficult. But, but I think value is value, and the risks are so great. We've seen this over the last five years. Mm -hmm that failing to think longer term actually ends up biting in the short term. You're saying investors long used to hold onto their stock for seven years, and now it's seven months, so it's yeah. become a short term mentality. Feike, isn't it interesting that this is not just a US issue? You're seeing this in your part of the world. I mean, this is a global issue. We've seen the, you know, the, the lack of trust across the world as it relates to demonstrations True. and upset. True. Um, uh, well, building on what's being said by Dennis and Indra, um, trust is down, but it is only maybe a few companies who spoil it also for the whole group. Uh, it's a hyper-transparent world. Uh, in what world are we operating? I would like to go back that we should realize that the role of business in society has been changed. hundred years ago, it was mainly especially about running the economy, uh, providing jobs. Today, businesses need to realize that their role has been changed. The boundaries between what is public interest and what is private interest has been blurred. Companies have a public responsibility as well, taking care of the environment, taking care of the uh, social issues in the world as well. And that is a change. And if companies do not express that change and do not make clear that they see that they've brought a responsibility, what I mean, uh, creating value on three axes, people, planet, and profit, and not only profit, uh, and taking up that responsibility. Uh, if we do not really show that off, then I think that distrust will remain. The distrust also that what was the final idea about the economy? Is the economic growth in itself a goal, or is it a means to something else, having a better life with seven, later on, nine billion people? And I think the idea about economic growth is all focused on that. And in the last 30 years, I think we lost sight of that. Well, how, how much is this upset about the issues of the day? Youth unemployment at 
terribly high levels, unemployment for, for young people. You know, the idea that you're looking at certain economies bump along the bottom, unable to really get into a sustained growth mode. How much is it about the issues of the day that we're dealing with these economic challenges, and how much is it about business not operating in a way that they ought to? Richard. Well, I think that's why the, the breakdown in trust, Maria, is regrettable, regrettable, because, in fact, I think business is a big part of the solution for youth unemployment and some of the economic issues that we've got. Um, and I think what would be terrific would be for governments to be setting economic policies that sustain and support business and business growth, small and large, so that we can employ more people, invest and the like. But at the moment, as Dennis said, there's distrust. And so we're not getting the, the economic policies that are promoting uh, more lending from banks. In fact, the, the, the policies around financial services at the moment are, are creating a problem there. Uh, so I think that's um, the regrettable thing, that we're not, because of this breakdown in trust, um, policymakers are seeing it as their role to make it, in a sense, harder for business and put in more constraints, whereas business I think, and I agree with Faki, I think business uh, understands that our role is far greater now than just creating wealth for our shareholders. We need to create wealth for all our stakeholders, our employees, our suppliers, our customers, the environment, the communities in which we work and our shareholders. And I think if we can do that with good economic policies, and, and one of the reasons I'm in Davos this year is because Australia hosted the G20 this year, and, and we're really hoping to get some strong policy settings from the G20 governments this year that will foster the growth of business because then we can employ more people and we can uh, invest. And I think that breakdown in trust will help. And if I can just go back to Dennis, your question, how do you, how do you get past this short term thing? I mean, I've been CEO now for nearly nine years. Uh, so I've, I'm well over the average, as is Indra. Uh, and so I now don't meet with short term investors. Uh, you, uh, you've, you've made a change. Yeah. You will not meet with short-term investors. Because I'm not running the company. Or but we're how do not you running know the that they're short-term? Sure. I mean, how do you know that they're necessarily short-term? Because we, you, you <laughs> know a profile for investors. We know if they're short-term. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, it's not worth their time meeting me because I'm not running the company for the short-term. Yeah. Well, if we may add to that, um, of course, there are not many CEOs, by the way, who say, I run it for the short-term. Most CEOs say, I run it for the long term. You don't see it always in the actions they take, but uh, they always say the right things. Our system, however, is very much focused on one of those contributions. Not so much to the contribution to society, nor to the planet, mainly economic value. If you look to the valuation of our companies, it is mainly based on our economic performance. If you do it really bad on environmental, et cetera, then you can get a hit in your share price. Well, but if you do it mediocre or better, you don't see it really in the value of your company. And I think that is wrong. If we say we need to create value along three axes as a company for several stakeholders, then the value of our company should represent that value mm. creation. And that requires, at the end of the day, a system change and otherwise, it will always depend on the goodwill of some CEOs or some companies or some boards or some shareholders groups. But a system change in which the value creation on the social and environmental axis is really represented in the value the company provides and has. So, I'd, argue, sorry, I'd argue that as a company, if you, get, if you do those other things well, you'll become more attractive as an employer. And if you can attract better people, you'll be a better performing business I over agree. time. I absolutely but believe in that. But I think we that. have some issues to address because what you both are talking about is how do you manage a company for level of returns and duration of returns? Because when we talk about the short-term oriented shareholder, it's a small vocal minority. But they're vocal. And so it feels like all the shareholders are short-term oriented. The truth is a large number of shareholders depend on this company to be here for decades. They want the dividend. They want the you know, gradual capital mm -hmm. appreciation. A small vocal minority that seems to rule the roost uh, demands something very different from the company. And the company has to flex for that small vocal minority. The second is that vocal minority typically does not care about, quote, sustainability issues. Because I think we as companies 
have not done a very good job framing the sustainability issues. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've talked about sustainability issues as corporate social responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we framed it as, mm -hmm. you know, we make money and then we'll do a program in Africa or a program in India, in and that's corporate social responsibility. I think we've got to change the dialogue from what we do with the money we make versus how we make the money. And that, that's what drives shareholder value. So when you treat your employees right and therefore you can attract a great uh, you know, group of people into the company that can keep the top line and profitability going, that's a form of managing for duration and being a responsible company. When you uh, do the right things to reduce the carbon footprint, reduce your water usage, your plastic usage, you're doing good things for the company and good things for society. So I think we have to redefine managing for duration as how we make money, not what we do with the money. Yeah. And the vocal minority is still jaded by companies talking about corporate social responsibility, which I think is a form of you commit the sin and then you confess after that. <laughs> I think that's a bit wrong. And I think business schools have to re-educate people yeah. because business schools in, business, in, in the MBA program, they say, make money at all costs. And if things don't go well, the uh, law school will bail you out. And go to the environmental school if you need help to handle all these green NGOs. And if everything fails, the divinity school will pray for you. It doesn't work that way yeah. anymore. I think we've got to bring everybody together and say, there's an ethical, responsible way to run companies yeah. and make money, change the dialogue, and that'll you, rebuild yeah. the trust. I think you make a good point in terms of the schooling. Uh, and, and that shift is beginning to happen in, in business schools. People, and I think it's happening as a result of the students. That's where the motivation is coming from. So, so the good news here, this is not all doom and gloom, right? Because notwithstanding the comments around corporate so, uh, social responsibility reporting, We've seen a, a, a lot of progress on that front. And to me, that, is, that was a very important first step. But to take it to the next level, Andrew, maybe to where you were going, when companies actually start reporting critical metrics around what's really important to the sustainability of business for the long term, the impact of business on the environment, the impact uh, you know, of business in terms of job creation, the social uh, types of issues that we're really talking about. When those metrics are clearly defined and companies are prepared to have a lot of transparency around the reporting of that so that you can begin to tell that story from a longer term standpoint, then you're gonna really start to make some real progress in this As long rules, as we all accept that business cannot solve all, all the, problems the problems of economies. I, I mean, we cannot address youth unemployment on our own. <clears throat> Governments have a role to play. Yeah. So it's a partnership between business and government to make <clears throat> something happen. Well, yeah. I, want to, I want to drill down on a couple of these subjects because you made the point that government policies really need to encourage businesses. So I, the government business relationship is important to, to mention. But another thing that you mentioned, Richard, is you said, I'm not going to meet with short-term investors. Well, can you really say that, though? I mean, in, in an age of activism, in an age of activist investors coming and saying, we want change and, and, and motivating a, a, a new shift at the company, can you say, I'm not going to meet with you? Yeah, we can. Uh, uh, really? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because uh, um, if they're short-term investors, yeah, I mean, uh, you know. But they're going to say, I'm not short-term investors. Uh, I want change because I want this company to be healthy in the long term. Well, if they are a significant shareholder, then, then I'll meet with them. Otherwise, I won't. But see, <laughs> one of the things we did um, some years ago, Maria, is we actually moved from quarterly reporting to six-monthly reporting because we felt that quarterly reporting was just way too short term. Can you do that in the US, move to six month reporting? No, no. of course I think, not. I think that's a, uh, a debate that's been had as for as long as I can remember, and I don't see that happening in the near term. But, but we are seeing change happen because you know, there are more than 100 companies that are pi piloting the concept of integrated reporting, which says very explicitly that they're running companies, the company for long term value creation, and that that's defined in terms of financial capital, but also natural capital and, and other things. We, the rules that we have right now on accounting are pretty young. They've only been, they've been around for less than 100 years. These are not things that were handed down on Mount Sinai 2,000 years ago. And they can change, and they are being changed, and I think it's reflective of, of all of this as, as CEOs understand uh, that <clears throat> to be good le leaders and good stewards, that they have to take this longer view. You need rules of the game that create incentives that allow that. We all feel that, that tension, of course, and we all feel it's not easy to escape. But you can do something. I mean, when I became CEO seven years ago, 
I went with investor relations uh, to a lot of short-term shareholders, uh, less than three months as an average. And I was telling with full enthusiasm as a new CEO all my strategy and plans, looking to the audience, I said, well, is there anybody interested? Because within three months, they're already in or out to share. Mm. So um, That's very uh, frustrating. Uh, exactly, uh, especially uh, <laughs> as a new CEO selling your long-term strategy. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I think uh, what we did is mainly focus on more long-term shareholders, and I cannot influence what is happening exactly from one quarter to the other quarter, I have a bigger impact on what's happening from one year or three years to the other uh, period. And what we especially did is said, well, we do one thing, we provide you uh, a guaranteed dividend. We are not going to fluctuate with the dividend. We guarantee you um, uh, a dividend over the years above 3%. So you should be happy with that, I hope. And then we are going to make you the right, and at the end of the day, you cash on top of your, your dividend. And that is a different approach, and especially when you work in a company with a lot of technology and a lot of uh, longer-term development. I cannot change the company from one quarter to the other quarter. That would be impossible. Of there will be fluctuations from one quarter to the other quarter but not real strategic change. You know, before we can really communicate business is doing the right thing, we should talk about what is doing the right thing. We've got big investors in the audience, and, and, and later on in the, in the program, we want to hear from you. What is most important to you as an investor? What do you all think is most important? I mean, we know that shareholders want to make money and see value creation. What else is important in terms of running an international organization as you all are? Let me start with that, and this goes back to the trust question. I think the reason trust is so important today is that when you think about the world that we're trying to deal with, uh, all the issues, all the challenges, the speed in which you need to be able to make decisions, if you don't have trust within your organization and you don't have trust with your various stakeholder groups, there's no way that you can move with speed, with agility. In other words, Trust almost serves as a real break. If you have trust, you can go faster and you can deal with the issues and the challenges. If you don't have that trust bond built with your investors, your various stakeholders, your employees, et cetera, you're gonna have turmoil. You're gonna have the ability to not drive the kind of change and react to the environment that's really, uh, that we're facing today. So I think that's one of the reasons why getting this trust equation is so important. Maria, I, 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 I I obviously worry a lot about financial performance because if, as a corporation, if you don't, over the long run, perform well financially, either you're gone as a CEO or your company gets taken over. So I, I worry a lot about financial performance and, and I think as a CEO you have to. But the thing I worry most about is reputation, which is just what Dennis was saying. So our, our reputation is the most important thing that we, that we look at because that then goes to our ability to attract and retain people, it goes to our ability to form relationships with, with suppliers and with other business businesses, and it goes to our ability to expand, and it goes to our licence to operate in the countries in which we operate. So doing business the right way, financial performance, a good reputation, reputation as it relates to what? Employees, the community, what are we talking about? What is doing business right? All stakeholders. You, you run your business for several stakeholders. And of course, that is for the financial community who invest in you, and you need to deliver. But also for your employees, otherwise you cannot show any performance. But also for the society at large. You cannot hide behind politicians who cannot agree on CO2 emissions and then continue CO2 emissions and saying later on, yeah, we contributed to the problem in the world, but it's not our fault, it's the politician's fault because they couldn't agree. No, all of those you need to take into consideration. And let's be honest, we cannot do it alone as business. We need to do it together with governments. But let's also be honest, governments cannot do it alone anymore. 100 years ago, you had kingdoms or whatever, and all the public matters could be decided by one uh, boss uh, being the king or being the government. And that is impossible. Part of the solutions are in hands of the private sector. And we need to collaborate to address the issues of the world. Mm. Maria, we, I hope we've all learned from corporate failures of the past. And if you look at big iconic companies, Kodak, uh, the WorldComs, the Endrons of the world, let's go through why they failed, each one for a different reason. Kodak was an iconic, fabulous company. Didn't make the investments to shift its model. 
from one to the other when technology was changing because they were too busy focusing on quarterly earnings. Um, so if you come back and ask the question about what's doing business right, are you going to run the company for the duration of the CEO or the duration of the company? And if you think of the duration of the company, it's decades. If you think about the duration of the CEO, it's whatever the CEO decides is his or her duration. So if you're going to run it for the short term, the duration of the CEO, the day you take over, you just say everything that the previous CEO was, did was wrong. You take a huge charge, and then you ride what they call the alpha. And then when that alpha is about dead, you say, I'm retiring. The next <laughs> CEO comes, crashes the earnings. Books have been written about that. Okay? So if you don't make the investments to transform the company, over time, as the world changes, and the world is a very volatile place today, the company cannot sustain itself for decades. Or you end up doing accounting uh, irregularities like certain companies did, and they don't exist anymore. So I think doing business the right way is financial integrity, transforming with the changes in the market, and thinking about duration of the corporation, which is decades, not the duration of the CEO. And in this case, I'll toss it back to you and then I'll give it to you, Aaron. The media has a role to play in it too. Mm -hmm. Because you all operate with sound bites. You're in a 24-7 environment. I am yet to see a thoughtful interview by media of a CEO mm -hmm. giving them time to talk about their strategy. You edit the thing down so it's all sound bites. It doesn't mean anything. You all pick up comments that are random and then attack the CEO. For heaven's sake, everybody has a role to make yeah. business successful. And the biggest role is media, because you amplify the short-term investors' bully pulpit. And don't ever talk about the long-term investor. In fact, when it comes to sustainability issues and doing business the right way, it's almost dismissive, the way media talks about it. So at some point, we're going to have to toss it back to you, Maria, and say, What's the role of media also? Because yeah. I, I agree think it's a that. partnership. I agree with that. I think it's very important. The media has an enormous responsibility to ensure that the public is getting the real story uh, with regards to corporations today. I think one thing that was said on the panel, which is really quite stunning, you said 90% of the companies today are doing business the right way. Well, why aren't we seeing the perception really exemplify that? And I think it is that bully pulpit. It is the media. It is the news. It is really constant in your face of this is bad and that has been bad. Yeah. Um, so I do agree with that. And uh, it's one of the reasons I tend to do, I like to do longer interviews to give perspective to investors. But why do you think, putting the, putting the media aside, why do you think the public is so angry and 90% of businesses are doing the right thing and people aren't seeing it that way? People feel very vulnerable. The pace of change is intense, and CEOs feel that uh, and have some ability to steer the ship. The public um, feels it doesn't have much of an opportunity to steer the ship. So we've decoupled um, economic growth and profitability from uh, labor and employment at this point. And so we have chronic unemployment and underemployment in, in many parts of the world, and I think that leaves uh, people feeling very, very vulnerable. I want to come back to one institution. But how do you move the needle on that? How do you move the needle on this chronic unemployment, particularly as it relates to young people? This is really the tragedy, because they're losing an enormous amount of time in terms of experience. And then they get a job, and they don't have the skill set required. Any thoughts on moving the needle on well, this? Well, I mean, it's, well, um, as I said earlier, I'm heading up the B20, which is the Business 20 as part of the G20 this year, Maria. And one of the, we're looking at four areas, trade, infrastructure, financial flows, and human capital, people. And, and, one of, and, and in talking to people, you know, countries like Spain with chronic youth unemployment and highly educated um, people of that who are unemployed and, and, and no prospect of a job, and yet there are companies in other parts of the world that would love to be employing these people, even doing it online, um, so, so they can stay in Spain and, offer, and, and help. But the, the laws of, of our countries don't allow this at the moment. We, you know, we, we've, we've got to open this up. So that's why I talk about a, uh, government, uh, government and business has to work together on this, because there are opportunities for business to help solve this issue, not on our own, and we need to do it with government, but, but, but the need is there. The need within business for hiring good people is there. Hey, Mir, Mir this, this, this point about why does the public believe that 
uh, you know, the, so, the, the focus is so much on financial performance. This is not a new topic. This has been building for so many years now. And I think the general public believes that business exists to drive financial returns. And I think that's been a, a, an image that has been created for so many years now. And I think that's why it gets back to the role of business in this debate to really define exactly why an institution exists, what its purpose is for society, which is much more than just delivering the financial performance, the financial metrics that we're all familiar with. And I think companies can start to change this debate with much more transparency around why the organization exists, what it's trying to do from a longer term standpoint, what are the right kind of metrics that you really want to have out in the public domain, and hopefully maybe with the dialogue with the media that begins to shift this debate to say, yeah, business is here to have a financial return, but it also exists for a lot of other reasons for the betterment of society, to deal with some of these big societal types of issues. And I think that's the role that we have to play to start to change the debate and get it focused on the right types of issues that are very important, that are top of mind for a lot of people around the world. But as a leader, right? I mean, as, as leaders of international businesses, isn't the onus on all of you to really communicate that to the public and to your stakeholders? I mean, there are some businesses that people, they understand. I mean, Indra's business is an international beverage and food and snacks business that people can understand what they're doing. There are other businesses that people it's not as obvious. And isn't the onus on the leadership to really communicate what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve? No, but Maria, I tell you, you say our business is obvious. Absolutely, <laughs> it's obvious. But I remember two years ago, and you're well aware of this, the media would write saying, or investors would even ask saying, why are you transforming your portfolio mm. to become more healthy, to reduce your salt, sugar, and fat? Mm. Because we believed that's what the trends were. And the right thing to do was to shift our portfolio to but go where the consumer it. was headed. What did the media say? Your job is to sell more fat, sugar, and salt. What did some investors say? We want short-term returns of a level higher than what you're generating if you focus on the core. Today, that same investor, two years later, is saying, why aren't you shifting the portfolio faster? <laughs> and the media is saying, oh my god, these trends are coming. Why isn't PepsiCo shifting? You don't write a memo and say we're going to shift. <laughs> shift takes years. You have to invest in R&D. You've got to change the fundamental business model. I'm going to ask the question, who wrote a sensible article or conducted a sensible television interview saying, this is the changes in the marketplace. We are seeing it in our own habits. I'm glad you're changing. Give us some tailwinds. So when we come back and talk about what Dennis said, I think where people you know, interpret business actions as financial returns at all costs, OK? This at all costs is the problem. And when companies have to transform and they're doing the right things, they face more headwinds than tailwinds. Mm. And I think we have to shift that. Mm. Investors have to change the way they hold companies accountable. Mm. Media has to change. And I was just telling you, it hit me in the head when we were talking to a bunch of investors from Hong Kong. And they were representing Chinese sovereign funds. And they opened the meeting, investor meeting, by saying, we want to invest in big companies that give us a dividend for a long period in time with decent capital appreciation. We're not looking for short-term alpha, as they put it. So the questions they asked us were about the long term. Are you investing to transform the portfolio? Are you investing to hold your people and build talent? And the investor meeting right after that was, so what's the quarter going to look like? <laughs> you right. see, this is the short term, long term that we CEOs have to deal with. But we have to do both. But the more people we can get into that first bucket, I think you'll see more lasting institutions. And you'll see the trust in business actually going up. Mm. There's a, an ingredient here we haven't talked about yet, because media are, are short term in their focus. Consumers are, investors are. Boards are asked not to be. And I think the role of boards in providing some space for companies to make these decisions is absolutely crucial. And we have begun to see some change. I think that needs to accelerate as well. What kind of change have we seen on the board level? Well, you now have many companies. Um, if you look at the S&P 500, a growing percentage each year has a committee that's dedicated to looking at 
either sustainability issues or, or some sort of uh, interaction with the broader changes in society. And I think that's hugely important because it means that the issues that in many ways are a proxy for long-term value because of the underlying changes taking place in, in the world, um, those things are, are discussed in a way that's institutionalized within the board. That can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. We want to open it up to the audience. So uh, we have microphones around, and I also have questions from uh, Twitter. We have a question right here, gentlemen in the um, fourth row. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Renat Heuberger, I'm a social entrepreneur in climate change business. Uh, my question is regarding the concept of shared value, which has been a kind of a hype in the past two years. What do panelists think about that? Is it possible to do um, basically good for sustainability while actually uh, enhancing your own business, for instance, in your supply chain? Is this a real concept that you see working, or is this just a, a hype? Yeah, th there are conflicts inherent to what we're talking about. As leaders, you have to make the decision. Uh, in terms of shared value, who would like to take that up? Well, there, there are many examples, uh, more and more, because society is changing, uh, that there is a business model to make money which providing sustainable products which contribute to the environment. This green growth, so to call, uh, is a real existing thing. What we do is we take waste from agriculture and uh, turn that into fuel and materials where we now throw it away and burn it. Uh, we develop new materials, making cars lighter and less CO2 and less fuel. But we make money with providing those products. So due to the change of mentality in the world and due to the collective, I think, change of that we need to address those issues, that provides a business model as well. So I'm a strong believer that this can be a clear direction. Even though there are conflicts. Sometimes there are conflicts, as we have also, if we build a new factory in Europe, it's always with a wastewater treatment system. In China, it's not always needed with a wastewater treatment system. And our Chinese competitors are not doing that. We say, this is our norms, our values. If we do it in Europe, we do it in China also. Do we run sometimes that we need to really boost our technology because we are competing with competitors who do not do that because it's not obliged? Yes. Is that sometimes a little bit uh, a conflict or internal tension? Yes. But you need to believe in your values. If you do it here, I do it there also. This gets back to, in my mind, there's always conflict in every single decision that you're making every single day. And without having a clearly articulated purpose as to why the institution exists for the long term, you're never going to have that compass to be able to make these kinds of decisions short term or longer term to balance off, not just at the CEO level, but throughout the whole of the organization, I think that's really important to get that alignment that you're really looking for. We're, we're going to get to you in a moment in the back there, but I want to just tackle this first Twitter question from um, Mar Maestre Morales. Uh, and he says, how do you tackle extreme inequality? Is major global risk that keeps, it's a major global risk that keeps widening. Is this an issue that business should have front and center? Inequality. Well, I, I mean, I'd argue the way you tackle inequality is to create more wealth and create more jobs. And so business has to succeed for that to happen. Um, just by focusing on a reduced pie isn't going to solve that issue. Uh, and then businesses that are, that are, whether they're large or small, that are growing and successful, that can employ more people, can also, I think, um, ensure that they're doing the right things in the supply chain, which is another one of the Twitter questions, uh, and, and through that, some of the inequality issues that are quite extreme in the world can, can be dealt with. But, but business has to succeed. Business has to be able to grow. It's a very important point, uh, I think it's, creating it's jobs. connected yeah. to the trust we were talking about. Mm. A lot of people do not see the benefits of globalization, the benefits of industrialization, the benefits of automation, etc. Look to the United States, how many people are unemployed, how many people are below poverty level, etc. So those people are lacking trust, obviously, because they say, what is this all brought for me? Use unemployment, etc. So if we do not reduce the inequality, uh, not only globally, but also within the different uh, areas of the world, then, of course, I think that distrust will be there. Right. And then it no, is amplified by some examples of bad companies by the media, and then the whole picture is there for people who do not yeah. have it. Here, but you, know, you, you, made a, you made an important point in terms of technology changing and the, and the, and the uh, you know, automation. That's killing jobs, right? So 
I mean, that, that's creating a different shift in terms of jobs. So do we have the right skill sets and, and education in place to ensure that that next generation has the skill sets required to actually compete? Well, to bring one of my uh, hobbies in is uh, in many Western parts, not in the developing countries, but in many Western countries, labor is not cheap. And we tax, and 60% of our taxation incomes are coming from labor. And only 30% of the raw materials we use. And is that a logical system we have built to have a high taxation of labor and a low taxation of what we really scarce of, a scarce raw materials? So a shift between taxation incomes for government from labor to scarce raw materials is maybe not a bad idea to address. Do it. governments so Maria, understand your point that? about technology killing jobs? Yes and no. It's killing jobs, but it's creating jobs, yes. right? And I think that's the thing that's Very gotta be well to Thank you. understood, that there's a lot of opportunities out there, and I think the role of business, you can't do this on your own. So there's a role for business to talk about what are the skills that are really required for the future with governments, so you get the right policies in place, with institutions of higher education to make sure that the training that's being provided, the curriculum is, is relevant for the skills that are going to be necessary for the longer term. So I think the role of business is right in the center of this. I don't think one institution can tackle that issue on its own. But the Dennis, question what you're also saying is governments need to think long term too. Exactly. I think that's yeah. also changed. I think governments are Great thinking point. for short term election cycles yeah, yes. and that's creating havoc in the whole system. Point, this is a very important point that keeps coming up in the panel. The Government and business need to understand mm -hmm. priorities and work together, whether it relates to taxation or, or, or labor reform. There was a question in the back there. Uh, yes, sir. And then we'll come to you. Hi, I'm Jeremy Balkin from Australia. Um, in terms of doing the business the right way, there's been a lot of focus on finance as an industry and doing things the wrong way, I guess. If you're a young man in finance, who do you look up to? What's the role model? Because all you ever see is the Wolf of Wall Street. All you ever see is Madoff. Who, who is the person to look up to? And why aren't they given the platform to tell a positive story about the importance of finance in the world and doing business the right way? Well, Jeremy, um, as an Australian, I can tell you that Gail Kelly is someone you could look up to who's, a, who's the CEO of Westpac. And, uh, and she's an outstanding CEO. In fact, we're very fortunate that the, the CEOs of our four major banks in Australia, I think, are all outstanding. And actually, it raises an interesting point, which goes back to one of your earlier comments, Mary, about how you get this trust, because it is so hard. One of the reasons Australia came through the global financial crisis uh, in good shape was because our banks were in very good shape. Every time our banks report their earnings, they are slammed by the media for making too much money. They make a decent return on equity, not a great return on equity. I'm not, I'm not one of them. Uh, and we should be celebrating the fact that we have strong banks that have supported industry and business, large and small, through a really difficult time. But, but, but was it every always time, like that? I mean, was it always like that, or is the pressure from the people such that the media is, you know, focused on? Okay, this is an enormous amount of money. That I mean, I, I'm just wondering if the if the last decade or the last certainly five or six years, as home prices have plummeted and and unemployment has risen, um, the people have been so vocal and that has triggered the media to focus on or do you think that the media has always been doing that? I, I, th I think it's probably got worse. I think it's been around for a while but I think it's got worse. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please finish it. No, no, that's... But yeah, I think Gail Kelly's a great role What's model. really interesting is when you look at, let's just take Wall Street as the proxy for it, people get very upset when Wall Street fails, the, the, the financial crisis. People also get very upset when it's succeeding. That tells you that something is fundamentally wrong. And so I think the notion of what the purpose of the financial sector is, financial services sector is, has to be redefined. Some people, including people who are here, Anthony Jenkins from Barclays, Peter Sands, Sander Charter, are, are talking about uh, these questions. And the purpose of the financial services industry is to enable the rest of the economy uh, to grow and thrive. And so I think you talked about this, Dennis, and, and Indra, you talk about this all the time. We talk about people, planet, and profit. The, the fourth P word is actually a lot more important. What is the purpose? And I think, to, to your question, I think, I think the world needs to understand what the purpose of this sector is, and then there will be leaders who will be uh, looked up to a bit more. Has the leader, is the question here that we're going to get to in a moment, has the, the leader 
today, does it need to be someone different than it was 10 years ago? This is a Twitter question. Um, uh, does a stronger business government partnership to long-term sustainability require a new breed of public sector leader, a new breed of leader in charge? Absolutely, I would say so. I think to run uh, public companies, to run government, I think you need a different breed of leader. I mean, all the stuff we've been talking about, if that doesn't get completely uh, uh, embedded in a company, mm. and then, you know, all this conversation only lasts for the duration of the CEOs running the company. Mm. So it's critically important that we develop leaders who think like some of us do, because if you don't, you know, the next leader that comes up says, I'm going to run in for the duration of my CEO-ship, as opposed to running a lasting enterprise. It's not easy, because a lot of the senior people who grew up in companies grew up in this short-term at all cost mentality. So there's a whole retraining of senior leaders that needs to happen. And I think the pipeline of people needs to be trained too. The young people who are coming up, uh, the business school grads, I think we have a hell of a job to do uh, to uh, reprogram a lot of people to talking about what's the purpose of business, what is making money the right way, um, Going back and looking at the lessons of the past, the failures of the past, and talking about what could happen to companies if you don't do the right things at the right time, I think it's critically important we retool business education and use some of those cases to retool uh, the employee mindset in many companies. We have a hell of a job to do in front of us. And I would also add, uh, great points, Indra. I, I would also say the role of boards has changed in a very dramatic way today versus five to 10 years ago, because quite frankly, even if you have a CEO who's really turned on and gets it and is driving the balance, if you will, between short term and long term, if you don't have a board that is very supportive of that strategy and providing the cover to deal with potentially the ups and downs of how you carry out or execute that strategy, that CEO is going to fail. So I think the role of the board, the composition of the board, how the board thinks about many of these issues is uh, changing in a very, very but powerful way. But what we're way. talking about requires that you think about it in your emotion, and your heart. It's not an intellectual exercise. Mm. If you think about it as, I just got to do it to punch a ticket, I think it won't last. Mm -hmm. If you really feel the issue and feel that you've got to make a difference fundamentally, and it's embedded in your psyche, I think you'll make the change. So you've got to pick people who feel that way, not people who just mouth those words. Critically important. Question right here. First row. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Catherine Garrett-Cox. I'm Chief Executive of Alliance Trust. We are one of the UK's leading and responsible investment companies. We are long-term, actually. We've been doing it for 125 years. So I think we have a degree of authenticity in that space. But the question I'm interested to, to ask you is really coming back to a point you made at the beginning about natural capital considerations. So I think part of being a successful leader, and I, I agree with a lot of what you've said, is about doing the right thing and, and doing it right and embedding it for future generations. So to what degree are you, in the way you run your businesses, fully integrating natural capital considerations in your quarterly or half-yearly reporting? Can you explain a little bit more natural capital constraints? The world that exists around us, um, not, not just in terms of water usage, but how you're actually valuing the natural capital that live, exists around us, um, the land, the water, the environment, not just financial considerations. Yeah. Yeah, we do it a lot. We have developed a, a system which is called eco minus, eco neutral, eco plus, and we have evaluated our whole portfolio. Uh, what kind of products are eco plus that they provide a lesser environmental impact than competing products for the same purpose? Uh, when we started with that 2010, we had 30% of the company being eco plus. Uh, today, 40, and we want to have 2015, 50% of the turnover of the company is products which have a lesser environmental impact than competing products. We have developed now the same system for what we call people plus. The impact on society is more complicated, and we have only evaluated uh, evaluated five percent of the company. So I cannot give a total view on that one yet. 
but uh, it needs to be a consideration, and it, and it is strongly, and we report uh, about that. Um, come back to my point made earlier. At the end of the day, is all of this, although reported and uh, set in our integrated report, is this also represented in the share price at the end of the day? I, there are many days that I think I hope so, I think so, I say so, but um, if I'm honest, I think our economic performance is the main driver of it. But, but these things are quite relevant. You know, one of the mining companies that, that we work with presented the challenge to us by saying, when we decide to invest in, in a new mine, we rank it from one to five, and we think that we're ranking uh, projects as a four when they should really be a three, and things that uh, are three that really should be a four, based precisely on this, because the question of natural capital as well as the relationships with the communities around for that industry are as fundamentally important as, uh, as the technological challenges of getting the ore out of the ground. And so that shows that at board level, these questions are beginning to be asked because of an understanding, not that we want to be seen as good stewards of the environment, but because we won't succeed with these projects if we're not. You know, there's a, there's a Twitter question, and then I'm gonna, uh, if we can bring a microphone here, we're gonna get here next. But there's a question, Indra, and in the, specifically including PepsiCo, they're saying, how are Pepsi and others creating social value by buying locally in countries of operation? Clearly, you're creating jobs in, in local locales. Absolutely. I mean, all of our businesses are local. I mean, in every country, we're a food and beverage company. So in every country, we're local. We hire people locally. We have very few expats. And as much as possible, we source locally because at the end of the day, the more jobs we create, the more consumers we create. So it's, again, a mutually reinforcing model. So I think it's critically important that big multinational companies who do business the right way worry about standards of operation around the world are local in every country, because we can actually be engines of growth in every country. But just going back to something Aaron said and a question that you asked earlier, Maria, we talked about retraining employees, retraining people to think differently. We have to talk about retraining boards also, because many boards you know, have been around for a while, and many of them are still steeped in the old shareholder value measured only in terms of financials at all costs. Only few boards have become progressive. So I think we also have to start thinking about board memberships and how we make sure mm. board members have the same spirit of purpose and consciousness that we're talking about. Sure. Otherwise, CEOs are going to have a hell of a job you know, trying to convince their boards that this mm -hmm. is the right strategy. Is there still a coziness between boards and executives? I think less so. I think in the past, CEOs used to stack the boards. Today, CEOs are shaping the boards, which is really a big difference. And I think that has to happen because you've got to shape the board for the future. But the old, in most companies, at least those that I've observed, it's not a, it, it's not a stacking process anymore. Question here. Yes, Stuart Wallace from the New Economics Foundation, the Think and Do Tank in London. It's really a follow on to Catherine's question. Um, we've worked for many years on social responsibility, triple bottom line, uh, social and environmental reporting, etc. But when we talk to long-term investors, increasingly they're saying, actually these things don't add up to much. They're nice to see, but they don't change the valuation of the company. So does the panel think we actually need to move towards a single bottom line that actually incorporates the environmental and the social? or at least some of the bigger factors. We're working with a number of people like the Institute of Chartered Accountants on this issue, but I'd be pleased to hear the panel's view. Thanks. I would say shortly, yes. How do you do that? You can do it in many different ways. An um, impopular thing which sometimes being proposed is to have differentiated taxation. Uh, and via differentiated taxation, uh, you can push automatically your performance in um, uh, environmental and social issues into money and then into a single bottom line. But there are different measures also which you can take. So, uh, I'm slightly different, Maria. I mean, I, in a sense, Dennis, I'd argue that the only, only thing in the financial statements you can believe these days is the cash flow anyway, because mm. the P&L statement of companies can be changed by depreciation policies and a whole bunch of things. So the only thing you can look at is the cash flow statement. And believe me, um, that is the most important thing in a business, because if you're not generating cash, you'll go broke. So, um, and so I think you always have to have the cash flow statement, and that has to be and has to be audited, and 
Then I think you can have a whole bunch of other things, which Dennis has alluded to, which can go to your sustainability reporting and how, how you best measure that and how that is um, portrayed not only to your investors but to all your stakeholders. And I think that's incredibly important. But, but cash flow is, you know, without cash flow, none of us are going to be in business and, and those things be, cease to become important. I think, there's a, I think there's a lot of work that's being done around the world to get at this question. It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, as you really start to drill down on some of these complex issues, you can begin to see reporting really going in the direction of sector type of comparisons, having clear rules, procedures that can get the kind of comparability that you really want to see as an investor from one company to another. It's evolving. It's going to take time. It's really, really different. But over, over time, and I don't know what that time period is going to be. I do think you're going to get to that end result. But sure. Dennis, isn't sure. it ironic that we business uh, executives and business in general are supposed to be engines of efficiency? But when it comes to getting together and deciding an integrated scorecard or deciding certain ways that we ought to have companies looked at, we cannot seem to make yeah. progress at all. We've been yeah. going at this for years. Yeah, in the interim, you know, we get beaten up, we get criticized. But you know, I'm I'm really pointing a finger at ourselves sure, and saying for some way, for some reason, when it comes to really figuring out common ways that we can talk about ourselves, we are unable we to. We with it big time. I agree with that. But I think one, one, one angle we didn't talk about yet, and that is the Main Street, Wall Street discussion yeah. and the tension uh, and the pressure of the financial market and all what they want to us. Where is that money coming from? From our own employees from the people in Main Street. Yeah. I mean, the pension funds are the investors. Uh, the but, money but of the Main bank are coming from ordinary stocks. people. So it is an angle we didn't touch yet, that most of the money is coming from the ordinary people who do not have that trust. And their voice, because it's their money, their voice is not really hard, uh, is not really strong. So would you here. rather have a pension return that's high or a job? <laughs> So it really yeah. comes down to but that. You, you Reasonable pension debates. return in a job or a very high pension trade return in no job. So mm -hmm. it's a trade-off. <laughs> Indra, one of, one of the reasons, though, we haven't been able to agree on, on that reporting is because we all do it. We're all seeking some competitive advantage, which says in itself why these other non-profit measures, non-cash measures, are important. Mm. Because we're all trying to, in our own way, have a narrative which says you know, as a company, we're, do, we're doing some good stuff and that's why you should come and work for us, that's why you should come and do business with us. So that, that I think, actually is a good thing. How many people in the room, show of hands, think business is doing the right thing, operating in a good way? How many people do not think business is doing a good job? Oh, goodness. What's your main gripe? Mm. Why? One, just one comment. You want to take it? I'll come back to you. Uh, in the United States, we have problems of massive flow of money into politics, where businesses are working very hard to undermine regulations, undermine taxation, undermine the multi-stakeholder initiatives that are needed to solve our biggest problems, and businesses are at the table undermining those efforts. OK, think about that, panel. And, and you're great. Because I think that business haven't got an internal conscience. They, are, they don't follow an, an internal conscience. They are, um, we have to develop a framework, a political framework, in order to bring the conscience to business. OK. Wait, Maria, Two comments. Politics, money. Question. If we went out on the street, maybe not in Davos, maybe somewhere else, and asked the question, my guess is you would get precisely the opposite. Absolutely. And that's the challenge. What is it that the public doesn't know, see, understand? Actually, um, this is the World Economic Forum audience. This is, this is not Main Street. Right. No, so I'm, exactly. I'm actually, th these are idealistic people, informed, global minded. So what, I, I agree with that. And then the question becomes if there is that disconnect, what is it that people on Main Street don't see, don't understand, don't know, don't believe um, that people in this room do? Because bridging that gap, you, you may have just hit the nail on the head. It's bridging that gap that's crucial. But let's, talk, let's talk about this money in politics. I mean, this is, this is a real concern. One of our participants is voicing it, that business is, is dictating policy by paying for it. 
Yeah, but let's be careful. Don't demonize. We should be very careful not to demonize business because everybody who works in business are also citizens of the community. Their moms, dads, aunts, uncles, you know, fathers, mothers, whatever, when they go home. So we want to be great citizens of the community. We want our communities to do well too. So when we come into work, we don't suddenly become a monster and lose our conscience. So I'd be very careful to say that you know, business doesn't have a conscience. Business is not this inanimate object. It's a bunch of us in business, people like all of you here. And in terms of the US uh, and the fact that business may be thwarting good regulation, I think business works with government to say, let's have sensible regulation and let's understand why the regulation is going into place. Very often what you have is regulation or legislation that's being proposed where you don't understand why it's going into place. You don't understand whether it's for revenue grabbing or for sensible policy. And when that happens, it behooves us to make our point and our voice heard. And that's what we do. I think it's important that people who think that business stops regulation unnecessarily or without a good reason actually goes in and understands why business is behaving the way it does. I honestly believe in most cases, may not be all, in most cases, business is just trying to understand the logic the rationale and the downstream consequences of the regulation. Because ultimately, a regulation is passed. We have to live with the consequences of this, the costs of this for years. And it's not just in the US. Whatever's passed in the US is going to go global. So we have to think about this issue in a much broader terms than perhaps the lawmaker in the United States. So I think that's yeah. why we push back and ask a lot of questions. We've made a full circle because we come back with the conscious to the trust we talked in the beginning. Yes. And life is more complicated than the people without a heart went after high school to business and people with a heart went to NGOs <laughs> or uh, government. Exactly. Life is more complicated yes, than yes. that. I uh, and That's I think that um, uh, people with conscience and without conscience, you find them in all parts mm -hmm. of, uh, of society. And, you know, and it comes back that we, governments and companies, need to convince the public at large about the trust they can have in their institutions. If we cannot have trust anymore in institutions, our main system collapses. So we and, need and to trust in the jobs go with it. Dennis. To, to respond specifically to, to the comment about uh, US engagement, business and uh, regulations, et cetera, the role of government today coming out of the financial crisis has never been more significant in terms of its impact in the economy. Uh, and when you think about politicians, their need, desire to get reelected every couple years, how much knowledge and expertise do they have in terms of how and what policies are going to be put in place to really think about the longer term, to grow an economy, to really encourage jobs, et cetera, versus reacting to maybe some of the pushback coming out of the financial crisis, uh, you know, all, all the, the bad things that happened, and the need to demonstrate that you're making progress. That's why I think you're seeing so many new regulations come into play, regulations that most people would say are holding back growth, that are adding costs of compliance, uh, complexity to the economy itself. Therefore, I think business has an important role to play to try to influence, to get the right conversations, the right debates on the table so that as these new regulations policies really get enacted, there's a mutual understanding of the benefits, the costs, and maybe the unintended consequences of some of the things that are being talked about. This is a, a very important conversation. I'm uh, very happy that we were able to uh, hear from uh, some of the uh, people out there who have specific issues in terms of why this trust issue is where it is. We've come out uh, with a couple of headlines here. There is too much short-termism uh, and pressure on, on business to, to do business uh, the right way. There needs to be a better partnership between government and business to uh, better understand uh, how to create jobs on, on the business level. Uh, the media needs to better encourage this long-term holding and long-term sustain uh, ability uh, of business and not have knee-jerk reaction, short-termism. Uh, boards need to be modernized as well because the truth is today it is a new normal and there are many more stakeholders uh, today that business is focused on more so than just profitability and financial performance, even though that seems to be still the number one um, uh, 
um, certainly priority. I want to thank our panel. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much.